Hey guys, it's Ian from the Bankruptcy Club. I'm going to talk about 1862. Um, it came out not too long ago from GMT, so you can... It's unusually available for an 18xx game. You know, normally you're used to waiting, I'm going to say, a couple years sometimes. This one you can just order off a website, and it shows up in a timely fashion. Um, we've played a couple games now, and I think I've got the rules down pretty well. I will not be covering the rules... Point by point, I'm just going to kind of run down the overview here. Um, I do want to say the first thing I need to cover about this is that I hate the rule book. I hate the layout. I hate how you have to flip back and forth to find rules for things. Um, it references things in one part of the rule book and then doesn't come back to it for several chapters and then tells you to go back. There's a lot of flipping back and forth. I don't appreciate the way that the running routes is laid out. So many, many complaints about that. Regardless, I'm going to move on. Uh, it is a $15,000 bank. It also has a couple of endgame conditions as well. The cert limit is pretty high for the number of players. In a three-player game, you get 18 certs. Um, and your starting catch is also pretty high. Uh, with three players, you get 800 bucks. We've only played three players so far. Uh, the game does handle eight, which seems kind of crazy. And it goes as low as one with a solo rules that I haven't looked at. So this game, like some others, has a variable setup. So I've set up the board here uh, with the 16 companies, which will be in the game, of the 20. They're, they are represented over here. You've got your, your home stations. They have a little star on them. And they go on the board to help you tell which ones are going to be the game. There's also four of these not-in-play markers as well. So you know which stations will be empty for home bases throughout the game. There are two types of companies in this game, even though you start them... Even though, So when I say two types of companies, I mean that the Y and N... Any company up here, grab the wine in because I'm holding it, can be a chartered or non-chartered company. And the differences deal with how you start them in the capitalization. So with each of these 16 companies, you have a choice to make it chartered or non-chartered. And that will affect, like I said, the capitalization and also the number of tokens that you have. Each of the companies also comes with a permit, which you can see here. There are three types of permits, freight, express, and local. These are dealt out randomly at the beginning of the game. There's six freight, five express, and five local. Um, and you can acquire more through mergers and acquisitions, which I'll go through later. So uh, at the start of the game, there are two parliament rounds. So you got this guy here, you go parliament round, you do another parliament round, you go to a stock round, and then you run a cycle through here of operating rounds, parliament round, stock round. In a parliament round, you will be putting up for auction a company which you wish to start as a chartered company, which means it is full capitalization. I should also mention at this time, the companies that are available depend upon the phase. It's tough to see because I put a bunch of stuff on it up here. But at the beginning of the game... There's, there's eight yellow spaces. Those are the only eight companies that can be started at the beginning of the game. Once you move into phase B, that's tough to see, but it says right there. You can start from phase B, there's four more. And then phase C, there's another four. So in phase A, at the beginning of the game, you're going to pick one of these eight companies, and you can put it up for auction in a parliament round. Um, starting bid is zero, increments of five, and it goes around. If you win the bid, you immediately set the par value in the yellowed area, which says chartered companies, set the par value. Hypothetically, let's say 100, because that number is super easy to work with. You then have to buy the president share, which in this game is a triple share. It is 30%. So you immediately have to pay three times the par value. Additionally, you may also purchase two more shares at that time for a total of five. Uh, 
a company takes 50% to float. So if you win the bid, you pay your bid to the bank plus triple your par, and then you can buy two more and you can float a company straight away. When a company floats, it gets 10 times, when a chartered company floats, it gets 10 times its par value. So it is full capped straight away. Once you have won an auction at a parliament round, you may not start an auction. However, you may continue to win auctions should you end up in a situation where somebody starts a bid for a company, you outbid them for the right to start it, and then you are able to par it out and afford the president's share. Um, however, by the end of the stock round, if you have not purchased, I'm sorry, if you have not floated the company, the company has not floated. So you won an auction for the W and F. Okay, you had just enough to buy the president's share. You had three hundred dollars plus the winning bid, which is fine. If by the end of the stock round it has not floated, either through you purchasing two additional shares or someone else purchasing two additional shares, you'll be fined by the government because you have taken their money. And they don't like that. So, winning bids for companies is not necessarily the greatest thing automatically. Uh, you, you should probably be able to, to float the company if you win it. But maybe there's advanced strategy that I don't understand. Um, so at the beginning of the game, you'll do two of those. And then before every stock round, you'll have another parliament round where you'll do these auctions to bid for chartered companies. The other thing about chartered companies is that they have... This is, this is the chartered side. It's got a little gate on it. You get a home station... And you get two more markers. After receiving your initial capital of 10 times your par value, you pay $180 out of the treasury to the bank for your tokens. That includes your home station. And those are all the tokens you get with this setup here, right? Um, in the stock round, you can start a non chartered company, which is just, it's actually slightly deceptive. It looks like you can start in just these values here which are the same as above, but actually you can start them in any of these 54 to 200. So it's any, there's this whole line of prices down here that says non-chartered companies can start here. There's little arrows that bracket it in so you know, but um, the spaces above 100, you will just end up in the 100 to 200 here. So it's possible you could take your par at 150 and buy your president's share for 450 bucks and they would just set it over there a non-chartered company which is on this side you can see it's got the no gate that it is a partial cap which means that once you buy which means that if you start it like this what you're gonna do is that i'm gonna start it as a non-chartered company all of the shares that you purchase the money goes directly to the company so that 450 that I spent over here would go into the treasury. All the shares would move into the treasury. Then every time one of them is bought, you buy them at market value into the treasury. With a chartered company, they have a par value, and this is the IPO board, so you'd buy them at market value. Non-chartered, I'm sorry, non-chartered companies, always market value. Chartered companies, par value, unless it's in the bank pool, or it ends up in the treasury, which can happen later. Okay. The other thing about non-chartered companies is that you get between two and seven tokens, your choice, and you just have like just tokens, just all kinds of tokens, and then you would also get the, the home one. So you just have seven tokens, but like the chartered companies, you have to pay for them up front. They are slightly cheaper. They're only $40 instead of 60 but you're not getting that 10 times par value, so you kind of have to figure that out. Um, I mean, you can start the game and you're like, I'll just only have the two, or I'll have four, or whatever. That's your choice, but you do pay it up front. You will not pay to place the tokens on the board later. All up front. So those are the two types. You'll have chartered, non-chartered, maybe like this, and you get like a... Marker, what I put that 70 board to go there. Right? Good? Great. Cool. Um, like I said, the president shares are 30%. What this means, this is important, is that in a stock round, 
Um, you cannot have a company dumped on you if you do not have 30%. So if I have, if I have the IMB and the next player has 20%, I cannot give him the president's share. I cannot give him the company because he does not qualify for the president's share. Also, what's fun about this game, you can just sell the president's share. You can just, just get rid of the whole company. It's just, I don't want to deal with this anymore, and you just sell it. It's over there, yeah. That's not my problem. Um, this causes some rules later on um, with special running of directorless companies. Uh, you can, if there are shares in the bank pool, you can make change on the president's share. So if there was one, there was one over there, I could sell two by putting the present share in and taking one back. Um, but that's not always possible, since there has to be shares in the bank pool to make change. Um, when you sell shares, there's a zigzag effect on the stock price. Unless you start into these green zones, where it says ignore the first share sold, except by the director. It's over here as well. And then up really high, you ignore the first two shares sold, except by the director. Um, you can do a lot of this is zigzagging. That's how the stocks will go from one line to the other. So if I par this at 142, that's a 150. They're going to move forward and back unless they get sold. Um, there's a lot of, a lot of starting companies. There's 16 companies in the game. Um, so you're probably, probably going to be running some number of them, but at different times because you're going to end up collapsing them together through mergers and acquisitions. Um, once you get into the operating rounds, oh, this is when you're going to get into the good stuff. This game is a very small map, as you can see. It's, it's tiny. There's hand for scale. It's 37 hexes. I counted it earlier. Um, there are no empty hexes on the board. Everything has a dit or a city. The cities come in three flavors. They get your regulars, like so. You have your Ys, which are worth more. And then you have the N. Also, standard standard dits, gentle, sharp, straight. Okay. You get on your turn. You can lay two yellows, or you can lay an N, or you can upgrade it, or you can build a dit. Because when you when you build a, a dit in this game, like this, okay, that dit is there. Later, something will happen where you will upgrade this track to green. The green track has no dits printed on it. So you have to just match the previously existing dit on, on the new tile, like so. The thing about the green upgrades is they don't touch. None of the green upgrades touch. None of the brown upgrades touch. So this gentle curve that you laid 35 minutes into the game will only ever be a gentle curve. It will, nothing will ever touch that route except at these two ends. Okay, so. There's probably some advanced strategy that helps you figure out how to make this work. I don't know what it is. You know? So again, you've got like this. That's great. Um, this is a... Something goes there, and then later it turns into, turns into this. Put the dit on that same curve. And then this can upgrade to a bow and arrow. I don't have one of those out here, so you're just going to have to imagine that. Um, but as an action... You can just build a dit on a line that doesn't already have one. So on this russet tile, which is apparently the correct color, you can build a dit onto one of each of the other running lines through there. So the, uh, the greens can have two, like this. I'm not putting that in a hex. You just have to see that's what that looks like. Okay, That's an action. You can do that instead of upgrading 
for building yellows. The other thing you can do is to build a station in London. There's only four spots, okay? If you want to run to London, which is the good off board, if it goes 100, 150, 200, you have to have a token there. You don't have a token there, you can't go to London. It doesn't matter anything else. Okay. Uh, that's London, that's Dits. Got the good stuff here. So I have all these tiles up. I'm going to do my absolute best to try and recreate how to trace a legal route between stations. And I'm just going to hope I do it some justice because it is unusually complicated. Okay. Don't worry the colors. We're just, the colors are the only thing that matters right now, not the legality. All right. So you're going to run trains. I'll get into the different, the three train types here in a minute. But the important thing to realize about running trains is that is that you must include your home station in every run. So I have to go to the home station in every run. All right, it's got the star on it. That's the home station. I gotta go there. And I have a train. I'd say I have one of these these two trains. That's two, so I can go to two cities. Okay, one two. Don't count the dip. Don't worry about that. Go to two. Every additional route has to touch that previous you know, one of those stations. All right. I'll throw one of these in there too, like this. So if I have another two train, maybe you know, I'll say another two train, and go one, two, that's a route. I can also run this route because they touch at this station. I'm tokened out, but I can, both trains can end their route there and then move on. However, on the other side, each route also has to touch one of your tokens as well. So this is a two and it can connect to this two. And then like this two, I can also run a two this way. So there's, there's one route, there's another route, there's a third route. So I could run three, three twos through this, this setup. This gets more complicated when you start doing the different train types. So these here, each of the trains, each of the cards has three train types on it. So you've got a local, which is the blue diamond. Blue diamond, the local trains count cities as stops and the dits are bonus. So this route here, is uh, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ha! It's nine dollars. I'm gonna put this revenue on nine. Cool, All right? If it were an express train, which is the red number, it counts only the cities, which is seven. Not quite so high. The thing about local trains is that in addition to getting the dits, they also get, uh, it's, under, it's down here. You'll have to trust me what it says. That says major stations and all small stations and ten dollars per hex served into the company treasury. What that means is the, the government is subsidizing your train running through these hexes, so it's giving you your company ten dollars into its treasury just for running the train through there to help out. Express trains do not have do not have that bonus. The thing about express trains is they can go to off boards, they can go to ports, and then go to reds. Local trains can't. Okay, so stay with me because there's a whole other train type. All right, <clears throat> freight trains run in hexes. They can go to off boards. Freight trains only count the beginning and ending station for revenue. So I can run <laughs> then because they count hexes. This is a one freight train route. This is not because it has to end at a large station. So it can start here, it can cross one hex edge and end there, and that's not a station that counts, so that's not even a legal route. Okay, but on this one, beginning and end station, 20 and 30, 50 bucks, cool. 
if I get another freight train, they add together. I'm sorry, if you get another non-permanent freight train, they add together, and that becomes a single route with this range. So this runs like a two freight train. So it start here, and then cross one hex edge, two hex edges, and then go here. Okay. This pays $70 plus $20 for each intervening hex as the crow flies for that route. So this is 40, 70 with an intervening hex. So that's 20 sets. So that's also a nine, which is cool. I had a third freight train. <laughs> I could run from the port, go across one, two, three hex edges and run to the home station. Okay. When you run to a port, with a freight train, each intervening hex is $30 instead of $20. However, it is as the crow flies. So that means you're going to go 0, 1, 2. This is the, I mean, the, the route is, it could be like this if you wanted. That makes you feel better. 0, 1, 2. There you go. 30 bucks. Okay. This is only, it, it's really important when you've got like London where it's got like nine entrances or whatever. And if your company has built this route that enters over here, even if there's, you know, you're running this route, this is the whole thing. Like there's an example in the book. The thing about freight trains is it's the shortest route between the two hex points, okay? So this is the shortest route. You could spin this all the way up and come back down, but it's like this, okay? Look at the rule book, it has a picture. So, the other thing about running your trains, in that first example, when I had all these twos, like this, you only count each hex for revenue one time. Each revenue location. I guess that's the difference, okay? So, in this example, I had run a two, a two, and a two. But, even though I'm double tapping this N and this Y city, I only get to count everything once. So it'd be two, four, eight, 10, 13, $15, okay? I don't know where that is, $15. And then I served one, two, three, four, five, six X's. So I get $60 into the treasury. I have earned $15 and I can pay that out. Super cool. You can run multiple train types on the same route so I can run this so I can run like this two as a local and then I can run this two as an express and I can run this two as a local or I could run this as a freight and this is an express you know whatever the whole point is you only get to count cities one time only this is most important later on when you're running really long freight trains like a nine and you're doing like this thing so you're running like this with a freight train and then you're running a bunch of locals and expresses in the middle but no matter what you can run multiple trains on the track doesn't matter each revenue location will only count one time only one time whatever and then the whole thing with all of your routes must intersect each other somewhere at a large city. I just knocked the board out of the way. Must intersect at a large city, and you must hit your home station. Great. You got all that figured out. Super cool. When you buy a train, your company will have a train permit, which you have which is set at the beginning of the game. So the WNF was set to, I have this set as non chartered whatever. It's got an express permit, okay? Every company has to own a train. You can buy any kind of train you want, but you can only run what you have a permit for. So, beginning of the game, I could put $1,000 in this company. Let's say, I, let's say I did it chartered, okay? So it's there, I flip to that side, and I have, an express permit. All the trains in a particular phase are the same cost, so all the A trains are $100. If it's express local or free, right? The train limit is also unusually weird, where you can have three of each type, then two of each type, then 
three mags. But at the beginning of the game, you can own three of each type of train. And it says that somewhere. I don't know. I can buy, you know, with $1,000 minus my $180 uh, token fee, I got like 700 bucks left. I can just buy seven trains, right? I could just take, I'll take a couple express trains, a couple local trains, and I don't know, three freight trains, right? Cool. I've spent $700 on trains. I can run these two. I have five more. But I can only run those two. Additionally, for if you have some sort of advanced knowledge that I don't quite understand, you can buy trains that you can't run. Um, you have a train. You're not required to buy a train you can use. You're just required to have a train based on my understanding of the rules. This is legal. Thumbs up. <laughs> um... The reason that you would want to buy, you know, many trains that you can use is that the stock market features many jumps, many, many jumps. So it's hard. There's, there's numbers printed on both sides of the chart here. Um, you have to pay out at least your stock value to move forward. So for a hundred dollars stock value, I got to pay out at least $10 a share. If I pay $20 a share, I get a double jump. If I pay $30 a share, I get a triple jump. If I pay $40 or more a share, I get a quadruple jump. So, um, you want to run a bunch of trains because you want to get those those quad jumps because that's that's hot. That's a lot of money. Um, the way to do that is to merge. Merge or acquire. Um, at the beginning or end of a company's operating turn, it may merge or acquire with a company with that it is connected to. So in this case, uh, the INB and the WNF, there's a lot of ANs. Like most of the companies are blank and blank. The WNF and the INB can merge or acquire. So let's say that the, uh, let's say that the WNF was first. And it had a train, so it ran and it, it, it increased its value, okay? The INB, and then at the end of its turn, it can acquire a company. Or at the beginning of turn, it can acquire a company. Let's say you do it at the end, because you want to... If you do it at the beginning of the company's operating round, it doesn't run. And if it acquires the INB, the INB will be gone. Or if, you know, whichever of the two is there, I mean, you're not going to... It's... Okay. I'm getting way in the weeds on this thing, okay? You can acquire at the beginning or the end of your turn. There's reasons to do both. The point is, if you do it at the beginning of your turn, you don't run your trains. If you do it at the end of your turn, you do it after you buy trains. This factors into the stock value, okay? If they are connected, you can you can do the merger. I'm gonna call it mergers. They calls them acquisitions you have to do at the end. I'm calling them both mergers. You can do the merger. What happens is, you're gonna put all the assets together you're going to take the lower of the two stock values and add half the higher. So even if the WNF survives, you've used the INB as the base price. So it'd be $132, which rounds down to the next closest one. So now you're at 128. Okay. You're going to swap out all the tokens on the board. Should be a home station. Oh, good. I put it in the right spot. Okay. So you're going to swap out all the stations. You're going to look at the new par price. It's 128, so it would cap out at 100. If, it, if, if both of them were chartered, they'd stay chartered. If either of them was non-chartered, then the thing moves to the bottom. Okay. You swap out the tokens. You collapse all of the assets on the company. Critically, you acquire the permit of the company that you have merged with. So the WNF was Express and the INB was Freight. Now the INB has both. And that's how you get multiple train types. You run multiple train types. So it's possible at some point in the game to be running nine trains. That's a, you need to be smarter than me for that. Okay. The company that dies 
the non-surviving company, in this case the WNF, um, it goes it goes back to the IPO at the end of the whole process. It goes back and it can be restarted. Like its home station goes back up here, and you can just start that again in another parliament or stock round through the regular process. Okay. When you merge two companies, you end up with half the shares. Um, I suggest, at least according to the rules to make things simple, you own at least a total of 60% between the two companies before you merge. Because when you're done, that way you will own, at a minimum, a president's share. If you own less than 60% of both companies before the merge happens, there's some special rules with buying the president's share back. There's also a very complicated series of rules for exchanging shares in a certain order around the table with people who have half shares, you know, an odd number of shares that get divided in half, and then you have to do some swapping and then buying them at, at the, the current market value. It's really easy if you all have even shares. It's even easier if you're the only one, only one doing it. If you're just merging two companies that you own five shares in each of, it just ends up with five in the survivor and you're, you're great. Um, but merging is how you collapse your train permits together, how you, you know, put your assets, you swap your tokens out. You can't have more than seven tokens on the board. So like I've already put like, four out there, you know, I got to figure out how to get more, which would probably be to start another company and then give that three tokens and then merge them into this one. And then I'm, I'm everywhere. Okay. There exists in this game the greatest rule, the, great, the rule with the greatest name I've ever heard of in my life, the George Hudson Maneuver. What the George Hudson Maneuver lets you do is if you run your trains and you make at least $10 total revenue, so a dollar a share, but it is lower than your current stock value. So if the INB runs and it makes let's say hypothetically $74, it makes, I don't know what, $7 a share, right? It runs for 70, okay? 70 is less than, less than 100. You can uh, goose the dividends with money from the treasury to get it up to the minimum needed for a single jump. So you pay $30 out of your treasury, you get it up to 100 bucks, and then you pay out that money from the bank. Um, this is maybe more important later on in the game when you're up here at like $400 a share and you're paying at like $25, $25 a share. Um, it's looking a little rough at that point for you to try and make up that difference, but you can totally do it. And that's a way for you to drain money out of the treasury. And so if you've got a company that isn't running so hot, you can, you can drain the treasury and then uh, you know, sell the president's share when it comes into a stock round. Um, companies that don't have a president, companies in receivership, since you can sell the president's share, you know, it's sell the president's share. The INB is now in receivership. What it will do is it will run its, if it uh, has trains, it will run its trains and withhold. And then if it can buy a train, it does so. And it will do this as often as possible. If at the end of a, its turn, the the company in receivership cannot ends up without a train and cannot purchase a train. It will close. Additionally, there's also a bankrupt space down here at the bottom. If you end up on that by withholding, um, companies that close just go back on the IPO board and you start it later. Uh, you can save a company that's in receivership, but you can't buy the president's share out of the bank pool. You have to buy three regular shares and then swap them. So that's a fun thing. Um, buying trains. Um, like I said, you can buy any train that you want. Um, they come in, you, they're on the same side. Um, you can buy a warranty for your train. And the A trains and the D trains come with a warranty. A warranty goes on a train, sticks with that train, can't be transferred. When that train runs, you remove a warranty token. Um, warranty tokens let you run past the rusting phase. So A is rust with the C trains. You can hang on to this, and when someone buys the first C, you'll get to run this one more time. Um, assuming it hasn't 
run already, because every time it runs, it removes a warranty token. So if on the first round, three trains are bought, they all get warranty tokens, and you run the A's for like four ORs, they've burned their warranty token ages ago. It's not like a... It doesn't stay on there until it's used, like by the rusting. It's burned the instant you run it. Apparently, you wear trains down just by using them. It's weird. Um, so you can buy warranties. You can buy up to three. They're fifty dollars each. So you can throw a big old stack of warranties on that train. That's probably super important with higher player counts, like eight, when there's only seven trains, seven eight trains, and there's eight players. Eight companies start, and then there's not eight trains there. Um, there's a handy reminder here. It says trains come with a warranty. This tells you all the, the train sizes in the A, a band. The trains come in bands A, B, C, and so on. There are no train shenanigans between companies in this game. Buying a train, you buy it from the bank for less price. You buy current phase trains for list price between companies. So if you're in phase A and you buy an A train from another company, it's hundred dollars. It's totally got me in a game, and it was really unfortunate. However, later on, if you're in phase B and you want to buy an A train between companies, it's half. If you want to buy any previous phase of train. They are half price. So A trains in phase B are 50 bucks. You can't buy them in phase C because they rust. But this continues on. Phase E will rust the B's, but the D and C trains are half price. So 140 or. Uh, did I say 140? I did say 140. All right. Or uh, 180. You half price trains. That's between companies. If you can't afford a train, you have two options. You can sell stock or you can refinance. Selling stock means you actually have to have stock in the company through either being a partial cap company, a non-chartered company, or you will have redeemed shares from the bank pool at current market value. So. If this were over there and the price was 150, I could pay 150 bucks from the treasury and take this share and put it in the treasury. Cool. When you're raising capital for a train, you can sell shares in the company to raise capital. You cannot sell personal money. You cannot, I'm sorry, you cannot sell personal shares. You cannot use personal money. It's only the company. If by selling shares, you do not have enough to purchase a train. So let's say I'm trying to buy a $200 train and my stock value is 150. I don't have enough to buy it. I can't sell this share to get the 150 of the $200. So I just don't sell that share. The other thing you can do is you can refinance. Refinancing means you, everybody loses half their shares in the company and they are moved to the bank pool. So if I have the president's share, so I refinance this company to buy a train. I have 60% of the company. After refinancing, I have 30% of the company. But, and the reason that you do that is that it recaps the company again. So in this case, I would get another $1,000 into the company. And then now that I have $1,000, I buy five five B trains because they suddenly have a tremendous influx of cash. According to the designer, you can just, if, once you've refinanced, you can buy as many trains as you're allowed to afford. However, all the trains that you buy from refinancing have to come from the bank and you have to buy like the next one. Okay. You can refinance as many times as you want to. You can just keep refinancing, but every time you do it, you have, your, have to have the, the, the stock count that you have. So you go from six to three, and then you go from three to one and a half. And with one and a half, you have to buy back up to the president's share or, or just demand in the company. Uh, merging, you, you merge, you acquire, you start new companies, and then you merge and you acquire those. 
and all that good stuff. The game ends in one of three ways. I think it's three. I know one of them is the end of the game. It's up here. If the stock reaches the end, you're, the game's over. Um, if the bank breaks, the game is over. Oh, the third one is when someone buys the first H train, it triggers the end of the game. It doesn't say... Oh, it does. It says, it says end. So what happens is there's an infinite number of H trains if you don't have enough to make do. Someone buys an H train. What you do is you finish a set of ORs. Okay? This is the last opportunity that you will have to build. Um, because once you finish the set of ORs in which the first H train H train was purchased, you skip the parliament round, you go into the stock round. All of the shares that are in the IPO move to the bank. You can't start any new companies. You can't merge. You can't acquire. The cert limit becomes equal to the number of shares held by the player with the most shares. So, in our most recent game, when someone would win in this, this stage, I had nine, sh I'm sorry, I had ten shares on four certs. Ten shares, four certs. That was the most number of shares, so the cert limit became ten. Sean had, like, eight certs, so he was only able to buy two. Jeremiah had some number. I was able to buy six because I had three president shares. Um, every, but this means it's for every president share you have, you can buy two more, um, two more shares, basically. However, you can't start a new company. So it just has to be things that have already started. Um, you can't build any more. You'll run one more, you'll run three more ORs, and then the game ends. And since you can't build, the only thing you can do is token and maybe execute the George Hudson maneuver. You can fig you figure out your revenue and you, you pay it out three times, you do your jumps and the game ends. Um, once you have entered into the end game, the H phase, hitting the end of the game, may or may not end the game. I don't recall. Don't trust me, look that up. Um, it's, a, it's a real wild ride, this whole thing. I didn't even get close to covering all the minutia of the rules. I really hope I just didn't get anything, like, super wrong. Um, yeah, there's a there's a variable setup that's a lot of fun with the different permits and then the mix of companies that's in the game and the order of the way that they're, they're, they're staged out at A, B, and C. Um, you can capitalize in different ways. It's a, it's a real, it's a real wild ride. Um, I wish I had won it, because I haven't yet. I wish I was better at it. <laughs> uh, it but it's, it is pretty good. It's a lot of fun. And if you get a chance to buy it, you, you, if you get a chance to play it, you should. Uh, and like I said, it is just you can just go buy it on the GMT website, which is unusual. Uh, also, you know what's really cool? Is there's all these reminders on the board. So when somebody goes, hey, can I run uh, port to port? It says, no runs port to port. Can I run red to red? Uh, no runs red to red. And there's some... Some niggles, some some special rules and catches with those. I'm not gonna bother with that. Um, but there you go. Um, it's a good game. Counting the routes is is super tough, especially a late game when you're trying to run a bunch of trains on the same track. That's tough. But I think it's uh, I think it's a good game. You should give it give it a shot if you get the chance.